are you? Good, Denise. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Fine, thank you. That's good. And so I'm going to start in the beginning, and so I want to find out where you were born. In the beginning, I was born in Chicago. And what year were you born? 1955. And uh, who are your parents? Helen and Clyde Cools. And do you have any brothers and sisters or sisters? I have a brother and three sisters. And how was it growing up in Chicago? Uh, good, fast paced, uh, energetic. I went, spent eight months a year in Chicago and four months a year or uh, two months a year in, uh, what was it? Let's see, eight months a year in Chicago, a couple, three months a year in Colorado, and maybe a month in Mexico. Mexico? What yeah. were you doing there? My father loved Mexico. Oh, so uh, we'd always go to Mexico or somewhere, be it Mexico City, be it uh, all over the place. Oh, wow. But we'd usually take a month and take the whole family. Well, by then there was only three of us. So the three of us would go to the, somewhere in Mexico every well, spring break. He'd take us to different places. He was a, he was a traveler. Uh -huh. He liked to see the world. And um, what school did you go to? Did you go to school in Chicago? Chicago, yeah. I went to uh, Norwood Park Elementary School, Lane Tech, which is a technical vocational school in downtown Chicago for high school. And then uh, later on to Yavapai College in Prescott, Arizona, and uh, Arizona State in Tempe. And so is that how you got to Arizona? Um, I got here because my folks retired here. And um, I kind of followed them. I did not want to go back to Chicago. Chicago was, uh, when I got out of the service, the bus dropped me off in Chicago and I realized that I did not want to be there. <laughs> so uh, it took me about six months and I ended up here in Prescott. And what branch of the military? Army. Army. I was too young for Vietnam, so I spent my whole time in Germany. Oh, okay. And uh, so when you arrived to Chicago and then you decided to come to Arizona, uh, did you move here to Prescott? Yes. And um, I tried, I actually left Chicago for Wisconsin for four to six months and then Colorado and then Prescott. Okay. But it took me about six months to get here from, from Chicago. <laughs> And um, so then you li currently live, obviously, here in Prescott. Yes. And so how long have you lived here? 45 years. And um, what did you do while you were here in Prescott? Oh, geez. And we call it Prescott. Prescott, yes. <laughs> I've been corrected so many times. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know. I start, my first job was at Jack in a Box, right? That was my first job because I knew I had to eat. And... Uh, and I worked at an automotive electric shop and then uh, had a little landscape business. And uh, then I took off for Arizona State and uh, graduated there. Wanted to be a yuppie, so I ended up uh, graduating honors and uh, competed a couple different businesses against each other and went to work for Hughes Aircraft Tucson as a subcontract administrator buying missile components for the Maverick Missile System Program. And after two years, I decided I didn't like to be a yuppie, and I would rather wear boots and jeans and move back to Prescott. And uh, I think that's when I started my little landscape business when I was just trying to figure out what to do. And then got involved in the garbage industry and moved up to Colorado, where I was kind of raised as well, and uh, started a garbage company. And that about broke me and my brother financially, but we made it through and sold it. Came back to Arizona and started another garbage company and was in the garbage industry for 20-some uh, years. Sold the company, one company to BFI, which was a large national international company. Then the uh, third company sold to Waste Management, which was an uh, international company. And that was my start into the recycling business, which I do now. As I've always had a little uh, dabbling in the recycling industry and a demolition industry, so I've just stayed with the recycling industry. Been doing that for 30 years. And so is your business located here in Prescott? In downtown Prescott. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so then, um, how? when did you first hear, read, or learn about the Iron King mine? Well, I think I had to 
four wheel driving around there back in the uh, mid seventies when I first saw the place. I met the people that actually owned it, and uh, turns out they were my landlord for the property I was renting from them here in downtown Prescott for my garbage company and my recycle company. And I got to know them and they were just really good, decent folk. And somewhere around uh, late 90s, uh, early 2000, 2001 uh, is when I had actually bought it. And then I walked every inch of the place. And uh, it, it, it was so beautiful and so interesting and so much um, history. I had worked in coal mines before, so I had kind of a, an affinity towards mining and to be in the hard rock mine and to see all the old equipment and the shafts and the this and that of the Iron King and the beauty of the landscape around it was just incredible. So I fell in love with it and had great dreams and ideas about the place. And I think you mentioned to me that you bought it from the Gibbs. It was through Chuck and Faye Bagby that I bought the mines from. And um, so it seems that you were very enamored by the landscape and how you said your interest in history. Yeah. And that's what helped you uh, say, yes, I'm going to purchase this. Property. Yeah, the price seemed fair. They were willing to, you know, finance it, make everything easy. Uh, of course, none of us knew anything about the ramifications of uh, tainted earth, shall we say, or whatever the environmental channels of none of us had the slightest idea about that. Uh, although uh, I think the Bagbys knew something was was in the works, but they they didn't seem too concerned about it nor uh, too worried about it, <laughs> for whatever good, bad, or however that worked out. But they were they were you know good, honest people. I never thought there were anything bad about it. Mm -hmm. And um, so when you purchased the property and you said that you had some ideas what were some i remember faye faye bagby told me one time she says the way i was waving my arms around and looking out at everything and saying this and that she said you have to have that property you're just so excited about it <laughs> well i just saw the hillsides and the the, the giant uh and the mine side itself the giant borrow pit or the uh the, the gob pit or the glory hole as it was called. I just saw those things as opportunities to develop it into a landfill and to um, to just, my ideas were to refurbish the buildings and bring them back to life. But that turned out to be contrary to what my brother thought and he, he demolished them, which was against my will. But uh, anyway, uh, and then some kids burned down one of the buildings on the smelter site and a few other different things like that. Um, and people started like four wheel driving over it and all, but um, you know the site was just beautiful. Like the smelter property had the agua fria running through it, humongous, big cottonwood trees on it, and things like that that was just absolutely beautiful. It was just uh, one of the few rivers that ran year round above ground in the state of Arizona. For one thing, you know, it wasn't much of a river, more like a little tiny creek, but still it was water running. You know, and uh, it just. It was nice countryside. And so then you also purchased the smelter. The smelter, yeah. That was a couple of years later. And then uh, who sold it? I'm just curious for my, who, who was the previous owner of the smelter? Uh, that was Bagby's as well. As well. Yeah. And then um, do you know, I guess, about the current history of the site or what different things went on in the site? You know, I probably have a limited idea, but I have some idea of what it, what had gone on there. I'm sure I don't have anywhere close to a full grasp of it. And and then when we talked, you talked about some of the historical artifacts that you found in the actual Iron King mine and the smelter. Can you just describe some of the things that you saw from first originally purchased and what were some of the buildings that were there? Well, there was... Uh mechanic shop, ambulance shop, there was the shift foreman's building and the, the lamp house, uh, you know, where they would repair the lamps or where the miners would come in and get their lamps for the day and they'd turn over their brass tag, which was basically was the way all miners operated. It would tell you that so-and-so was in the, uh, in the mine, you know, by turning over their brass. That was where the lamp would go. Um, there was big, uh, uh, what were the big generators there at the at the mine site? Big 
open frame generators. There was um, mostly big, massive concrete mounts where equipment used to be. There was, wasn't was much left there. It was all scrapped out years before we ever saw it, but there was big mounts to things like that. Um, a more modern bathhouse, an older bathhouse. There was a, um, a little building that was an assay office was there. And that's the same with on the smelter property. There was also an assay office there. There was a, the last of the chimneys, which I guess there might've been as many as five of them at one time there. Uh, but otherwise we just foundations and mounts for things. It was some underground rooms and underground tunnel at the uh, smelter property that ran underneath the, the road, which was underneath the railroad tracks in his day. Um, and then in one building that was a solid concrete superstructure that was where they stored the dynamite, that building was used to, after the mine shut years later, it's where they stored all the old mine records and all the maps and map boxes and things like that. And that's where we originally saw literally tons of uh, paperwork and old, everything from the mine that was left over as far as payroll, employees, and all that was in that building. But unfortunately, it just got lost with time, you know. Was, uh, had I known someone was interested in it, you know, we certainly would have saved it. You know, a lot of the pictures and things like that we had given to the Charlotte Hall Museum to preserve. And um, what were some of the favorite memories associated with the site? One of my favorite memories, and I think all of my kids' favorite memories was we had an old 48 Greyhound, and we all went up there camping one winter weekend night. And we were camped on top of the hill by the old um, assayer's office at the Iron King Mine. And I decided to take a walk out in the middle of the snowstorm. And I walked across the road and down this narrow ravine and snowing. I could hardly see anything in front of me. And all of a sudden there was this huge noise flapping in the wind and this white owl came out of a abandoned mine shaft, which probably saved me from falling into it. But I startled him and this white owl with probably five or six foot wingspan just came right past my face. I could feel the flapping of his, of his wings. And uh, I was so scared, I almost spun right around, went right back up to the big old Greyhound motorhome we were living in. And it's an old miner's tale that a white owl means there's gonna be death in the mine, there's gonna be an accident in the mine. It was a, it, and it, it, it makes my hair stand up my arms to this day, you know, because I almost would have fallen in that shaft that night had that owl not gotten disturbed by me walking past it and come flying out of there right in front of me. Okay, Warren, um, so I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about some of the miners that visited you while you were uh, there at the property. Most of the miners visited not necessarily at the property, but they came into my junkyard in downtown. Um, the junkyard property had been a junkyard for years and years, so a lot of people were used to it. And uh, some of the guys like Mac Road just found me down there and started up a conversation. Oh, you own the Iron King now, or oh, I heard you want the Iron King. And that's how I pretty much met him. There was a handful of guys, but Mac being one that I remember distinctly. Um, a couple of the other guys, I you know, I can maybe think of their faces, but I certainly couldn't remember any names. But a lot of them always talked about, you know, hearing a rumbling behind the walls on the 1700 foot level. And evidently the walls blew out. In the, it was a dry mine. It, it had no water. They had to pump water up from the back of Young's farm from wells up to the mine for dust control and for running the uh, the different, um, oh, uh, I don't know what you call them, the big uh, tanks that had this the water mix in them. But they had to pump all that water up because the mine was so dry, it didn't make much water. But all the old miners could tell there was some rumbling behind the walls on the 1700 foot level. And sometime, not long after they closed the mine, the wall of the mine shaft in the 1700 foot level broke loose. And um, we had actually lowered cameras before we ever, oh, it was after we bought it, but when we were trying to site our landfill, we had what they call a downhole viewing company drop cameras down into the mine. And the mine was 24, the main shaft, I think number six, five or six, they call that. Um, it was 2,400 feet deep. And when we lowered the cameras down, they hit water 
by the 400 and some odd foot level. And we turned all the cameras off and let everything cool down. Then we lowered them below the water and turned them back on again. And then the vis visibility was so much clearer after that being underwater. And, and they'd lower the camera down. You could see the um, adits every uh, 100, 150 feet. And you could see the end of the tracks. You could see the bell box where they'd ring the bell for the hoist operator raised and lower the man trip. Uh, you could see an occasional tool sitting on the edge, but it was all underwater all the way down, well, obviously from the bottom up. And uh, what we did was uh, we monitored the water level every year or every six months. And over the years, the water rose to approximately the 325-foot uh, level, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. That may not be accurate, but anyway, the water level kept rising, and there's literally miles of tunnels there, and um, it filled them all up. But they actually lowered, a second time, they lowered an impeller down there, and there, it, it, you, could, you could stand at ground level with like one of those two million candle-powered flashlights and shine it down the hole we had carved in the top of the concrete lid, and the water looked like, like a pot of boiling water. It was roiling down there. The water was just and it was it and when they dropped the impeller down, they, they said it was making or passing rel it was like a million some odd gallons per X amount of hours. It was amazing how much water that was passing through that place. And over the years, we thought that was the hi highest and best value of that place was capturing that water energy, but we could never get anyone to really talk to us about it. And no one knew where the water was coming from or where it was going from. You know, the only thing you could do is put a like a radioactive isotope in there and try to trace that through the earth. But you know, there was thoughts it was coming from the Colorado River. But later on, a guy told me that he thought it was coming from the Prescott Basin or the giant uh, caldera that uh, formed up in the Bradshaws that was holding millenniums worth of water. And that ruptured, that was draining out through the Iron King. But who knows what, you know, that's way beyond uh, any of our knowledge. But there's there's something going on there, and it's making a lot of water. Oh, that's so interesting. You know, it could, it could turn a, a, a propeller or an impeller and create electricity with the amount of energy just of the water passing through, through those shafts. And where does it go? No idea. Huh. But it was a lot of water. And you said it started around the 400 foot. Uh, no, the it, the water was up to the 400 foot level, and then it raised up to the 300, 325 foot level. But it was coming in at the 1700 foot level, and it filled everything up from there. And uh, in, in talking to there's there's a guy there, Jerry, a guy in Dewey Humboldt. Uh, Kind of reminds me of kind of a savant guy, uh, Jerry, and I can't think of his last name right now, but he was the one that surmised that it was coming out of this caldera of the out of the Bradshaws, and the water when it came in it was crystal clear and pristine water, but the trouble with water coming into a slip fault in the earth, the slip fault that create, created the ore body itself is in a sulfide plume. So it, it's sulfur coming up from the magma of the center of the earth. So it's a sulfide plume is what created the ore body there. And that's sulfur and S, I think, on the uh, periodic table. Well, when it was introduced to oxygen and water, you had the O2 molecule, and it would join with the, the, the sulfur molecule, and it would create... SO4, sulfuric acid. Then the sulfuric acid that it now created, it now leached all the heavy metals out of the, uh, the slip fault of the earth, and it created sulfuric acid and created more pollution into that water as it passed through. So it was freeing up the, uh, the heavy metals. At least that was the concept that he had. And it, it makes sense because the water, everything around her was uh, very alkaline. But once it got into that, that sulfur, then it turned to sulfuric acid, then it was highly acidic, and then it leached out the metals from it. And we did a number of uh, assays of the water to see if the water was worth mining. And it was super expensive and super diluted. <laughs> but it had, you know, um, platinum, palladium, um, of course, the, the, all the heavy metals in it. 
but platinum and palladium, but there wasn't enough to make it worth mining. But it was a concept anyway. And so for how long did he own then the property of the mine? <sighs> oh, gosh. Um, my memories, <laughs> I'd have to go dig through my paperwork to see it. You know, it's, it's so many things have happened in life since then. But I think we owned the property for well over, I'm going to guess, 20 years. Uh, we just sold the last piece of it off. Uh, the mine shafts itself just sold those um, here in the last uh, six months. But we kind of parceled it out into different parcels and slowly sold it off to different interested people. And then, so now we can, I don't know if you have anything else to add about the mine, I guess like some other stories when you were the property owner of it, because that was so interesting of hearing about the water. Yeah, the water was the most incredible thing that I still to this day think it's a, an incredible asset that needs to be uh, tapped somehow or another. It's naturally occurring. It's pretty, pretty neat. Um, no, you know, the property certainly had its... Uh, Issues with, uh, you know, tainted looking soil and things like that. Uh, mostly down below us, basically on the property that belonged to uh, uh, North American Industries. But, you know, we, when we came in there and we had the glory hole cited as a landfill, that was a neat thing. Um, it, it was one of the better engineered mines of its day in Arizona. Um, unlike Jerome, Jerome is on the same ore body. That ore body runs from Jerome clear through uh, Dewey Humboldt area, clear to Black Canyon City. If I understand it correctly, the ore, the ore body, the ore seam is probably 70, 80 miles long, and it's the same ore body. Uh, different concentrations of different material along it, but you know, basically copy, copper, lead, zinc, and, and the heavy metals. Um, but what they did is they backfilled as, as they, they mined it out. They would uh, stope over their head, drop the ore down, and then they created this uh, upside down barrel pit where they, I believe from the 800 foot level, they went off the ore body and went straight up and they started blasting and caving the, the virgin soil from above down into the uh, 800 foot level. Then they would load it in their mine cars and distribute it throughout the whole mine and they would fill up all of their uh, mined out areas with this virgin soil. So it kept the mountain solid by backfilling behind so it wasn't so much of a cave-in um, danger. Whereas Jerome, they just mined it out and left it hollow and then it's the whole mountains slowly settling down and sliding down the hill. So it was a difference there and that was the chief mining engineer, which was Gibbs as I understood it, was the one that came up with the idea of using the gob pit or the barrel pit, the upside down barrel pit to backfill behind themselves. So I always got kind of a kick out of so many people say, oh, there's miles of tunnels that go underneath Dewey Humboldt. Well, no, they didn't. You know, they, they followed the ore seam, which was off to the, uh, I think that's the east of town. And it follows, it, it follows the ore, <laughs> it follows the seam. It follows a slip fault, which is just a very narrow path where the earth slips like that. And that's where the ore body is. And it laid over on a, uh, I don't know what, like a 40 degree angle or something. And that's where the shafts followed. And then by, you, you could almost calculate out by how large this upside down hole was, how much they backfilled. So there is no voids there or open areas or anything like that. It was filled with this dirt. And that hole, that was one of the other most amazing things. I'd never seen anything like it. I've never seen a gob pit or a barrel, upside down barrel pit like that. But this hole, and we thought it was ideal for a landfill, it had to be two football fields in, in you know, it was round, so it was like two football fields in, in diameter. So 200 yards, oh, easily, 200, 300 yards in diameter. And on the high side of the hill, it was what was there in, in, in 2000, 2001 that we saw was it had a 190 foot vertical drop off. And what people didn't realize is that went all the way down to 800 feet. So that thing was 800 feet deep, but it, they caved it in and caved it in and they quit taking any out from underneath it. So it filled up. Um, 
you know, it might have been the 400 foot level. But anyway, there was there was uh, 200 and some odd feet of packed dirt between it and the tunnels by the time we found it. But that was the neatest thing. This this it was 190 foot deep on the high side, and on the low side it was probably about uh, 95 feet deep. And we hired a guy with this big Komatsu, the equivalent of a D9 cat excavator, that he just started pushing off that edge and he finally just made a road down to the bottom of that thing. And it was, I'd never seen anything. I mean, those guys, the old cat skinners, boy, uh, John was his name. Uh, you had to have some sand to do that thing and run that. You know, that machine probably had to weigh uh, 35 tons and he would run that thing right up to a 100 foot sheer drop off and just keep pushing out until he finally carved himself a road around that thing. It was, and we, I went in front of the, the county board of supervisors and several other people and actually got a permit to open that up as a construction demolition debris landfill. And then later on we wrote a grant with the Department of Agriculture and we had a big wood waste grinding operation up there. We ground up all the wood waste we can get our hands on. The idea was to make boiler fuel out of it. We had a real good intention of just giant recycling and uh, a neat thing, but it just didn't work. It was just too financially uh, burdensome. Then the ADEQ came in, then EPA came in, and it just, it was a great dream and it was a good idea, but it just, I, I think so often it created so much angst amongst people that lived by it that were just afraid of, you know, not in my backyard mentality or something like that. Shot it, shot it, shot it down, ruined it. <laughs> and so then you, as you mentioned, then you sold pieces of it slowly. And then... Well, we, yeah, we, well, we damn near slipped into bankruptcy over the whole thing. And uh, we, uh, we 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 were on the edge, and they just wouldn't foreclose on us because they, the lending company didn't. What are they going to do with two thousand dumpsters and all these trucks and all this and that? If they were out still earning a little bit of a living, um, they let us keep going for geez, year and a half, two years, and uh, they didn't foreclose on us. We finally found some guys that would buy the assets. So they bought all the trucks and all the hauling contracts and all that. So it was probably the closest we ever came to bankruptcy and uh, losing everything. But of course they didn't want the property. And uh, so we kept the property. And then over the years, we've uh, been able to sell off bits and pieces of it until we finally got rid of everything at the mine. I, I would rather have not, but uh, that's just, when you get in those situations, that's what you do. And then, um... Then how it seems like you got became interested in the Humboldt smelter. Then around the same time, I had a great interest in the, in the in the forestry and the wood waste thing. So I let some guys set up a sawmill there for a while. Uh, never charged them rent. Just let them try to experiment to see if they could make a go of you know dealing with these small diameter trees and the in the wood waste and things like that. Um, and I'm sure they kind of floundered a bit. They're still around, and they still have something to do with, uh, you know, they bought some of the pieces at the, the other side of the road at the mine and have, keep their trucks there and all that. So they're still around and, and in business. Uh, but no, we never did anything. We we got in there, and it wasn't long after getting involved with it that ADEQ came in and said that there's problems. And at that point, I went down to Phoenix and I took a seminar on what they call greenfields and greenfields legislation. And I thought I met all the intents of meeting greenfields legislation. I put up a fence. I, I fenced it off from the public. I kept the public off there. Um, we had a uh, engineering company uh, engineer a remediation plan for the whole place. We. Oh, gosh, we, we spent a fortune that we didn't have, but we thought we were meeting all the intents of the Greenfields legislation. And uh, boy, ADQ just wouldn't work with us. Uh, EPA, they kept changing people in charge. It was, it was a different person in charge every two years. And every time they'd come in with a contractor and do tests, oh, well, they weren't valid, we're gonna do it again. And it's drug, drug on now for eight, 10, 12 years with no answers. And I know the remediation plan we put together would probably be the best one to this day. Uh, but 
the bureaucracy moves slow. Um, and we had a stumbling block because we were willing to remediate everything on the top of the hill and around the chimney. But then they asked or told us we had to clean up Chaparral Gulch. And uh, that was literally a million dollar project right there. And it just wasn't feasible. And I had found a, lever, a letter in, the, uh, in one of the vaults at the Iron King that was written to their headquarters of Shattuck Den Mining Company in 1968 talking about the spill where their tailings dam broke, which is over on the North American industry side, and all those tailings washed into Chaparral Gulch. And that's why I tried to let ADQ and EPA even send them a copy of the letter. Uh, you know, this isn't our, we don't feel it's our issue, you know, but anyway, oh, you're the owner, of, you're the current owner of it, even though we had no, any, any connection with what happened at all other than trying to do the right things. But the more right we tried to do, the, the more it just, you know, grew and grew and grew a, a bigger and than we could ever, ever expect to touch as, as private individuals. And one of the nice things was that the Bagby family, I went to them when we were making mortgage payments and said, hey, I'm $30,000, $40,000 into legal fees right now, much less another $30,000, $40,000 in, in, uh, in environmental engineering fees for the remediation. And he signed a letter that I drafted saying, okay, they'd stop you know, collecting on the mortgage and let me at least put that money towards the legal fees and this and that. And I've never finished paying a mortgage on it. The only thing I do is pay the taxes on the property. But that was nice of Chuck Bagby, you know, because he realized we all got in a predicament that was much bigger than we ever expected, you know, for something that we had nothing to do with. And it's, you know, I'm not always in agreement with what's going on with the whole thing. It's, it's, um, I went to cover the uh, fly ash with uh, wood chips, and I, I had bro purchased and had uh, something like 300, what was it, 300 cubic yards of wood chips brought in that I was going to cover the fly ash with, so it wouldn't blow in the wind or get carried away with uh, with the rainwater. But EPA wouldn't let me apply it. Oh no, it's going to make more to take away, and the piles are still slightly visible on the property where I had set them. They've composted down to about one eighth of their original size and that's what would have happened if they sat in the other place. It wouldn't have it wouldn't have made any difference in the long run. But yet they didn't agree with the with the project. <laughs> so, uh, it's something now that I wish I never got involved in. It, it, it's just and it's such a beautiful piece of property. It doesn't need to be blown out of proportion as far as it it is. Yeah, because I know from speaking to community members that definitely the smelter and all of that is part of the history of the area. So they always talk about kind of these um, two uh, landmarks, I guess, for yeah. the history of the town. Yeah, it, I noticed it's in their town logo. Logo, They have the chimney there. You know, and it would have been nice to preserve the uh, the old assay office that's on the property that the kids burned down and things like that. It's still probably savable, but it's going to take investment to do it, you know. And I've talked to them about donating, you know, a certain amount of that property to them, 20, 30 acres, just, you know, because as I understand it, the EPA did not want to fund fixing something if a private landowner makes a profit off it or gets some ga gain off it. And it's, you know, what? Why as we'll give it to the town, let them have the uh, the benefit of it. But I don't want to lose completely either. I don't, you know, it's, it's like, oh, you know, it's that catch-22. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's an interesting scenario. Yeah, and so, but you're still currently, you still have the smelter set. Up. Yes. Okay. And uh, is there anybody that came to you from that were smelter workers or just were interested to talk to you? Not a one. Yeah. Never, never talked to anyone about the smelter. I... I think the smelter shut down quite a bit earlier, and it was uh, reclaimed. So, I mean, they took the big chimneys down and a lot of the equipment. Away. Then someone had leased the property and was melting aluminum there, doing some aluminum smelting, and that's a lot of some of the junkier stuff laying on the ground was from aluminum smelting. And that was, and if I'm not mistaken, that was after World War II, so it probably dates to the. Uh, mid 40s to early 50s i think they were actually melting down aircraft and that's where they started that business from so i think but i've never you know i've had no one ever give me any definitive answers on it 
I, I don't know. But I think it's been closed for years. I mean, probably 40 years before I ever saw it. Yeah, because that's the property that I haven't found any interviewees from, but because of what you're talking about, that it closed a long time ago, maybe some of the smelter workers were much older yeah. generation. Yeah, because it, it, was, it wasn't really related to the Iron King mine, and that's what a big uh, misconception is. It was what was called a toll smelter. So they would take um, gold and silver ore from the mines throughout the entire Bradshaws and smelt it there for the gold and the silver and whatever other tramp materials came along with it. And I know they, at least from the stories I heard from, I'm thinking the Bagbees or some other people that were up around there, that the ore that came out of the Iron King, they tried smelting it there, but it was a complex ore because of the, the arsenal pyrite it was, it was so heavily connected with the iron pyrite that they couldn't break it loose. So the ore from the Iron King was shipped to Morency, I believe, for smelting. So it ran through the iron, the, the Iron King ore was brought over to the smelter once or twice, but they never were able to crack it. So it, it, it was not, they weren't that associated. So it was a whole different thing. And so when the mining industry, you know, the gold, thing and all that, you know, that was the 1800s, early 1900s, so that it was gone by the 40s or, or 50s, and uh, that's probably when that place shut down, but I don't know for a fact. Mm -hmm. All the buildings were picked up and moved to Prescott, basically. Because that's what I was going to ask you, if you found any documents or anything like that, that like kind of similar to Iron King. Nothing, absolutely nothing. Um, the only thing I... I used to get a kick out of Chuck and Faye Bagby. There was an old, like all these old little towns had a little landfill on the side of the hill. And they used to go out there and dig antique bottles and stuff. And I'd found where they had dug and I'd kind of picked around it a few times, never found anything of, of any value. One time I thought I found a grave and it was late at night, little mark graves around the old mining sites. You know, when a guy had passed away and turn of the century, they just pretty much let him bury him right where he was at, you know. Customary, and they'd usually find some sort of like quartz bearing rock to mark as a headstone or something like that. You'd see some sort of delineation that would catch your eye. And I remember seeing it real sharply that night and never saw it again. Maybe it's a ghost story. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah some of the miners actually talked about uh, them hearing ghosts in the actual tunnels as they were mining. There, it's, when you work in the mines, that there's always the the stories. There's always the stories. Like when I worked in the coal mines, you know, there, it was always when you were just getting out of the lunchroom at two in the morning or three in the morning, and going back out into the one of the tunnels, you know. And uh, normally you worked in in gangs or in at least minimum two guys. But I worked as a electrician mechanic. Sometimes they'd send you up into the old workings all by yourself, where you'd be up there for like four hours fixing something or stripping a part off something, and you'd always see or hear something that sometimes make you want to just run out of there, you know? <laughs> all right. So are there any other stories that you want to share about the smelter set? Oh. Can't think of anything in particular. I've walked around and it's a beautiful site and down by the creek is awesome. Um, but I can't think of anything real in particular. Okay. And then, so thinking back on your experience with the Iron King mine and the humble smelter, what information do you want future generations to know about it? Hmm. I don't know. You just got to be a dreamer. Got to got to get out there and do things, whether they come back and bite you or if it's something bigger than you. You still got to get out there and do it and make the best of it. And it's all all in a day's work. You know, it's nothing nothing good, nothing bad, unless you get out there and do it. <laughs> and then, how would you like your memory of your work and experience at both the Iron King Mine and Humboldt Smelter to be remembered? Benign. <laughs> And then how do you think that the memory of the smelter and the mine site should be remembered? Oh, gosh. Uh, they should probably be remembered for what they are, a part of our history and a, part, a great part of uh, the development of our state and uh, creating employment. I think from what I heard, the Iron King Mine was 
one of the yar largest employers in Yavapai County back in its day. In its heyday, it was the largest employer. So uh, it both filled a big part of our development of be it Prescott or be it the state of Arizona. You know, from what I understand, uh, the uh, the copper and lead was discovered back in the 1500s by uh, traveling, uh, oh gosh, I don't want to say monks, but they're uh, whoever they were. But you know, it, it's been known that, that that existed there for a long time. It was uh, minerals are extremely valuable to uh, developing countries. So uh, it certainly filled a uh, important part of our history. And that's, that's a good thing about it. And I think it was developed and developed well. Uh, you know, what we know about pollution and the environment now is not what they knew then. And no one purposely did anything to really uh, hurt anyone. It's just they exploited nature. They exploited the ore bodies. And that's just the way it is. And I'm sure we're doing things today, all of us, that may be looked upon differently in the future. And that's what we have to remember is you have to put things in perspective of when they were done and what the mindset was in their day. And it, it, it created a lot of good. A lot more good than I think harm. I think the the harm sometimes is more uh, cerebral than it is physical, and I think some people are apt to get sick from things that ninety five percent or ninety nine percent of society aren't going to get sick from. It's just it's just the way it is, and it's it's part of a developing society. Things happen, and I don't think it was any no harm meant by anyone. It's just what it was, and uh, we all do the best with it as we can. And we should continue. <laughs> and is there anything else that you would like to comment or that I left out about your personal history or the Iron King Mine and Humboldt Smelter site? Uh, the only thing I can think of, we put a lot of hard work into it, a lot of uh, um, hard-earned dollars into it, and uh, had a lot of real good aspirations for it, uh, which kind of... ADQ and EPA and the bureaucratic, bureaucratic system kind of sucked the wind out of us sometimes and didn't leave any room for uh, the everyday man to participate. Um, I think sometimes it's almost a career on, on the bureaucratic side of it. And it's not always the best for the economy of the area or some people that are uh, attached to it without knowing it. So that would be my main thing. I think there has to be a little bit more concern for the everyday man in the middle of it.